So when this section talks about virtual hardware specific security configuration requirements, this is what it's saying. Consider how the virtual network we create, the virtual storage we allocated to a VM, the RAM and CPU speeds we give to VMs. What are some fundamental security risks and protections we should keep in mind? Here are a few. Always change the default admin credentials of the hypervisor software when you first install it. Hackers know all the default passwords. They know it. It's part of their arsenal of knowledge. Consult your vendor's documentation on how to properly allocate resources to VM creation as reflective of your hardware. Keep a good balance. Use least privilege and network segmentation to separate as many unique VMs away from each other to keep any virtual TPMs away from the customer environment. Secure access to the hypervisor itself. As far as networking, you as a cloud provider are going to be handling multiple different virtual customer environments on the same server, on multiple servers. That's a lot of chance for risk. Secure virtually created networks using virtual firewalls, network IDS IPS, system logging and monitoring, or any other network security tool that upholds confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And not only that, for networking, also physically secure where this Dell PowerEdge server is. Lock that data center rack and data center itself up with good defense and depth measures. And last thing for networking is, uh, look at this point. You got two networks going on on that Dell server, right? The network the server itself is on, on that data center rack, and all the networks you're creating for those VMs to join. Things get complicated, real complicated. One network is hard enough to manage, then pile on multiple smaller networks that belong to multiple other tenants, man, forget about it. You got to pay a lot more attention to the details of both and all networks when it comes to your virtualization security. And security configuration requirements for storage, it's the usual suspects again, right? Same as physical, have strong authentication with two-factor for your storage drives, don't use or enable TCP ports and other protocols that aren't needed. Like, uh, you know, you don't need any, like, VoIP or SIP ports open on your storage server. It should be just basic admin ports like SSH or FTP or, or RDP. Uh, that's it. That's it. All we have left now in this section is installing guest operating system virtualization tool sets, which is, once again, a complicated way of saying, hey, you can install Linux and Windows and Ubuntu on different VMs on a single hardware server. What are we used to? We're used to buying a single server or computer, right? Then only booting up Windows on it, or only booting up Linux on it. Or if you want, you install both, but you boot them up in different partitions on your hard drive, but not at the same time. One piece of hardware, one operating system. That's a traditional on-premise method. With virtualization, man, you can create four different VMs with four different operating systems, known as guest operating systems, on one single hardware to give you to give you have as long as you have the allocated the proper resources. And what this section wants you to keep in mind as a CCSP that each of these are each of those guest operating systems have their own specific utilities and tool sets and manuals. So check all those out before you try to install them on a certain server or hypervisor. For example, the hypervisor software vSphere sometimes when it's installing will have a pop up that says something like hey we see you are using an intel xeon processor for installing this software but we just want you to know it's okay for now but that future versions of this hypervisor software is not going to work on this particular hardware cpu so you may want to plan accordingly next next time same with operating systems another example i just thought of when it comes to understanding guest operating systems is if we use a type 2 hypervisor that hypervisor has to be installed on top of an existing operating system, which is installed on top of the hardware. So you have the hardware, install Windows on that hardware like we traditionally do, then install the hypervisor software on top of that, then create the VMs with different operating systems. So you do, if you do that, you don't have to do that thing we did with Type 1 hypervisor where you assign it an IP and connect to it from a different computer. You just load up Windows and load up the hypervisor software just like you would any program. So you have an underlying main operating system of Windows, but then use virtualization management software to create other VMs that are Linux or on other Windows, like Windows 10 or 11, but not Windows Server. Easy peasy. Or as they say in Counter-Strike, Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Oh, I love that game. You know what? I'm going to go play that right now because we're done with this video. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you in the next. Smoke caught in the reload. Advent wasn't ready in the no-scope from risk. You cannot be serious.